Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm a designer from frontend.com, which is a design consultancy. So um, I'm actually a fish out of water here, and this is my first time at a civic tech uh, conference, and my mind is completely blown. Um, so please uh, forgive me if I'm uh, seeming a little bit confused at any point. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to say three things today, uh, essentially, in these 20 minutes. And the first is that we shouldn't rely on public consultations um, as the only means of engaging with citizens. Telling people when you're going to listen to them is the first way of, of I guess, reducing citizen agency. The second is if, if we are in agreement that it's you know, important to open up citizen channel, channels for citizens to uh, raise issues with their representatives or institutions, is that you know, why not use those channels to communicate back directly to those citizens? And finally, you know, if we're creating those channels, and this is a note to practitioners in the room, you know, don't half-ass it. Uh, don't design something that those who are already engaged will use. Let's use this as an opportunity to engage those who don't participate in, in public uh, debate, and let's use this as an inc uh, opportunity to increase public trust. So invite citizen-initiated dialogue, utilize those channels for direct dialogue from government back to citizens, and then build disenfranchised uh, people in mind. So just quickly, I understand design is kind of a strange uh, thing to be discussing at this point, and design principles. Um, but I just kind of wanted to kind of, I guess, quickly go through uh, what design is to me um, and what it means. So when many people think about design, they think about this kind of graphical visual element. Um, uh, but actually, you know, in, in, in the world of, 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 of digital design, you know, a, a UI designer, an interface designer might kind of look at psychology and look at human perception in terms of bringing elements together on a screen uh, and laying them out so that people can, can achieve their goals. A uh, user experience designer then might kind of figure out how those screens flow from one to another to help the user achieve their, their goal or their, or their needs. Taking a step back, a product design person might be um, looking at kind of the tangible elements uh, on screen, but also the intangible things. So looking at data flows and looking at databases and how they uh, interact and, and change the product to ensure that business goals are met, not just user goals. And then the strate strategy design then looks uh, involves the same processes in terms of understanding the user and understanding the problems and uh, uh, to, to understand kind of, I guess, what, um, what, what the business should do next or what the organization should do next. These roles, I should add, are not mutually exclusive. Uh, in my own field of work, I typically work on probably those last three more so, UX, product, and, and strategy design. And at the core of each type of these uh, design practices is the belief that if we can figure out people's problems, um, then we can use, those, use that understanding to, to, to create solutions. So it's about understanding people. We conduct research, we ideate, and then we iterate on those designs. And this philosophy has served products and services very, very well. And so the linkages to policy, I think, are, are quite clear. And I believe the dimension, the divisions in our politics are, are due to this lack of empathy, understanding of one another. Um, and misunderstanding leads to mistrust, and mistrust can create bizarre uh, outcomes. Who would have thought that less than 100 years after my home country of Ireland fought and won independence from the British, that the British would fight for and win independence from us? It's a, it's a strange, strange environment that we're currently operating in. Um, and look, this is, this is a, in, in many ways a case of trust. In that situation, a, trust, a lack of trust in the European Union um, for, for voters in Britain. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, we talk a lot about that in general, but, you know, if you look at this chart here, uh, the, the government ministers and politicians generally are the, the, the lowest two on, on that rank of, of professions, which is below bankers, should I add. So that's uh, not a great testament to, um, to politics in general. And this is caused by a lot of factors. People in the room probably know better than I do. Uh, but I want to pull out two in, in uh, particular. One is technological advances. And these advances have contributed massively. Millennials, uh, in particular, are more familiar with the idea that you can tweet at a multinational corporation and expect to have an answer back within the hour. Uh, and that doesn't happen with government. 
uh, you can you know, sit on the toilet and order toilet paper with a push of a button. Uh, this is something that government is not prepared for, and this is our new world now. Uh, and these technological advances uh, do actually change our environment. They change our perception and they change our expectations. And governments haven't really kept up. Even though they have moved slightly with the times, they are now actually probably the most disconnected um, institution in, in, in our society, which is not good for what was purposed uh, in all essence to be the most open institution in our, in our society. So this is the disconnect that leaves people feeling disillusioned and, and I believe disenfranchised. So, you know, I guess you kind of have to look at, I guess, how people communicate with their public institutions and representatives. You know, we, people typically try and, I guess, you know, protest and petition and lobby uh, loud enough to create disruption so that they can be heard, uh, which is, you know, a pretty ineffective and a negative form of communication. This is very combative as opposed to uh, how we're told communication should occur. So that's the, the poor communication from citizen to, 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 to uh, their institutions. But equally, in the reversing that, uh, governments don't have a direct means of communicating with their citizens. And uh, the role of media is no longer, I guess, to, to kind of take information and distribute it. Uh, right now, the role of, of government is, I'm sorry, the role of the media is becoming more of this infotainment um, and, and, and to highlight problems of governance. So, this is a change of, of, of need and change of desire from, from media, which creates new media landscapes. And we're seeing that, you know, even, even beyond that, like this, sometimes they, the, they want to, you know, manipulate events to create a narrative. And so that leads to a very poor channel for communicating for, for government. The, the tide is turning. Uh, technological advances, we just saw Facebook there are, are looking at this and, and, and all these other kind of, I guess, tech tools and civic tech platforms. Um, and these are being used to, I guess, circumvent the outdated forms that we've just talked about. And governments are beginning to embrace open government principles to, to a degree, um, and looking beyond just public consultations in terms of how do, we, how do citizens participate in, in the process. Um, so at frontend.com, again, I mentioned that we're a design consultancy, but what we do every year is we, we do this design fix uh, program where we look at social needs and social problems and explore how design can, can have an impact on that or just see what happens when we bring design to a problem. Um, and so we, we have a white paper, uh, which I have a few copies of here, and it, we can download it uh, afterwards if, if you're interested in, in, um, in finding out what kind of it is that we've kind of came to. But uh, we also, from these, these, uh, from these principles, we created a concept just to help explain what, what we kind of are, we're getting at. So if this video plays, I'm gonna try and, uh, and play that video now. There sound in the program where we bring students together with professional designers to look at some of the world's biggest societal issues and I guess try and see how design thinking mm -hmm. and human centered. Yeah. Yeah, they're sorry. Is it papers that there? So every time you go to play a video, you kind of expect this is going to happen. Uh, oh, okay. That's right, issue. Yeah. Um, so I'll try that again. Okay, it's a four-minute video, so. Design Fix is a social needs program where we bring students together with professional designers to look at some of the world's biggest societal issues and I guess try and see how design thinking and human-centered design can solve them. Right now we're thinking a lot about our society and the obvious disillusionment with government. This year we asked ourselves the question, how might we reduce the gap between the citizens and the government and bring a sense of ownership back to the people? 
So working with universities and policy think tanks from around the world, we've been looking at how governments and organisations might create a cultural shift away from lobbying and towards a more constructive and direct dialogue. The user experience is the user experience of anything. Could be a service, could be an object. It's a relationship between you and something. And I think that the relationship between governments and people can be improved by a better user experience. So what we're doing is mainly focused on the idea of building trust again, using technology, but not only technology, more the idea of social capital and how groups can spread and build. Currently, there are a lot of really ineffective ways of communicating with government, such as protesting, creating online campaigns, spamming representatives in boxes, and generally these don't lead anywhere and they can create a lot of noise for representatives, as well as increasing disillusionment among citizens. So we've been thinking about how to engage disaffected citizens, but for any solution to work, it needs to reach them on the channels they're familiar with. So we prototyped a conversational UI powered by machine learning, which helps group and articulate the issues that users and citizens might be interested in. It can also be a vehicle to help citizens understand and contextualize what might be polarized views. The system reduces unnecessary noise for the public representative by answering questions where it can. And where a human response is more appropriate, messages can be aggregated or grouped with others that convey the same intent. These messages are then served up to the representative to give an overview of what the constituents are saying, and they can actually reply to those groups or individuals to host meaningful conversations on the platform. A public view is also available so citizens can see what the representatives are hearing and be assured of full transparency. So the key to this system is the feedback loop, which allows citizens to see if there's been any development under issue or whether it's been mentioned in Parliament or in legislation. So we conducted a pilot study with the Cork County Council, which is in the south of Ireland, to test the concept. And what we found when they rolled out a clear communication channel, they had a huge increase in the number of citizens engaging with them. And those citizens who did engage and received a feedback were far more positive in terms of their view on the council and felt they had more of an impact in society in general. So what we've proposed here doesn't solve populism, nor does it improve trust or services, and it doesn't make our societies more equal. However, making it easy to communicate and demonstrating the impact of that communication essentially are the foundation blocks to something much greater. We hope that this collaboration inspires governments and organizations to rise to the challenge of being more transparent and more responsive to the citizens they serve. Great. Um, so that's a quick overview of the concept that came from the paper. And I'm just going to quickly in the last few minutes, uh, I don't have time to do six design principles and I don't have time to go through all, all six, but I will, I guess, look at the overarching themes that they fit into. And um, it is three, instinctive, constructive, and reassuring. Instinctive is this idea, and we've talked a bit, a bit already today, in terms of making sure that what people, citizens, want to communicate and want to engage. And so making it as easy as possible for citizens to actually go and pick up their phones and share an issue with a representative or, or an institution. And constructive is the ability to hear. So it's making sure that pub, uh, public representatives, on, on the flip side, uh, we already saw with the Facebook example, they have so much material coming into them, but how can we make it easier for them to hear so you can have constructive and meaningful engagements going back? And then reassuring, which means making sure that this, this, uh, this communication uh, basically uh, is, is meaningful, but then also that uh, there's transparent updates so citizens can see what the result of that was. Um, so instinctive, which is the principles of immediacy, inclusion, and, and representative. Uh, the first thing uh, is basically just to go where citizens are. You know, we, we now have digital town halls, such as facebook.com, uh, and, and evidence proves that Building standalone websites is not good for engaging, especially those who are, who are not likely to engage. Um, so the question really that we kept asking ourselves was how can we encourage people to share their thoughts with officials and not their Facebook friends? And that really kind of boils a lot of the paper down. Um, 
You know, so this is not just about creating a digital platform or digital service transformation, uh, which is kind of the work of a lot of civic tech, but it's actually saying, well, beyond that, how do we create an, an environment of where people share? And we, we really looked at the, the environmental campaign, Reduce, Reuse, Recycle, um, for, for guidance here, because in that situation, they weren't just looking to, um, well, one, it was global, but two, they weren't just looking at providing information. It was how do you, how do you create behavior change around that? Um, and, and you know, in, in work, in our workplace, you know, on occasion, if someone throws paper into a waste bin, um, you, you know, you'll have someone else say, oh, you know, you, you, put, you put the paper in the wrong bin, you should put it in the recycling bin. And that kind of gets this idea of being a good citizen. If you recycle, you become a good citizen. And, and by the same logic, if you don't recycle, you're kind of this bad citizen. But how do we flip minds in the same way that we did with the environmental thing? Uh, to actually have that with the idea that, you know, if you don't share this opinion, if you hold, hold, hoard it to yourself or to your friends and don't share it with the relevant authorities or this concern, maybe, maybe does that make you a bad citizen? Of course, the differences are, are that it, the incentives are much easier for the environmental um, debate because in, typically creating things more to be more efficient usually made them cheaper. So I think it's really important to think of, well, what would the incentives be if we we're trying to encourage people to, uh, to, uh, to debate and become civically more engaged? Um, in the paper, we also talk about constructive, and this is the principles of, of, of representative and meaningful together. Um, and again, this is kind of public policymakers are you know, being able to hear what constituents are saying. Um, citizens, it's very important that they must both feel heard and, and actually be heard. And just being heard is not enough, and just feeling heard is not enough. Both are critical in terms of promoting civic trust. You know, so we had a almost 550% increase in mail to U.S. senders between uh, 2002 and 2008, which is before smartphones were prevalent. So you can only imagine that's now skyrocketed up, and the staff numbers are the same in these offices. So people just aren't being heard. It's, it's not that it's not that there's a there's more debate. It's that actually, if you do join the debate, you're kind of being more likely to be ignored than you were before. Um, and then also we kind of look at this idea of, I guess, citizen deliberation and, and participatory budgeting and actually how it, it does work um, in, in, in many situations. Uh, uh, the, in the paper, we talk about the Democratic Republic of Congo's uh, South Kinvu province, where people were not paying taxes. And once they started participatory, participatory budgeting, um, people were more engaged, people were more likely to actually pay tax once they saw the roads that they voted for and the, and the schools and, and the health centers that they voted for being, being, being built. And there's a 16-fold increase in tax collection, which is absolutely massive. And how would that work in the West? And then reassuring, uh, which is the, the principles of meaningful, informative, and, and transparent. Uh, Franz Timmersman uh, has a quote in one of his papers saying, obscurity is the best friend of conspiracy, which I absolutely adore. Um, so it's about kind of how do we, how do we use this opportunity, these, these platforms, these civic tech platforms, to realize an educational opportunity. You know, we, oftentimes we say civic literacy is the issue. Well, how, how can we address that in, a, in a maybe a not straightforward way um, and provide factual insights uh, as we do that? Um, today, again, it's, it's near impossible for a citizen to, to, you know, to raise an issue and then know if their input was considered or to know what degree it was considered or to, to know what effect it had on legislation or why or when it, was, it eventually was um, excluded from, from a, a policy. You know, so in, in, the, in, the, in the video you just saw, we had this kind of evidence, not just an evidence trail, but actually, sorry, not just an evidence-based decision making, but actually creating evidence trails where you, know, you could see your input uh, in, in a very personal way and how it moved through the, the, uh, the, the legislative agenda. Um, yeah, so finally, I guess I just want to point out if, if you are interested in these design principles, they are designed for uh, civic tech um, people. We had the idea of Facebook platforms in mind. We had you know, governments. It's, it's really both owner and channel agnostic, so they're, they're quite broad. They're really just designed as a, I guess, a, a, a thought, talking point or a starting point to really spark some ideas or, or decisions. They're not really um, too instructive. Um, and so as a commercial design consultancy, we really just want to acknowledge, obviously, this is not our field of expertise, but we are so um, inspired and motivated by the work you guys are doing. Um, it's been absolutely uh, beautiful to kind of be part of this the past year or so. Um, and to see that the good work that is happening, oftentimes uh, you don't see it too often in, in, in general discourse. Um, so that's something we want to acknowledge. Um, so, Governor Mila Mahogakarada, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.